Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Probably it's not morning for everyone, but at least here in Ukraine, it's like late morning. Um, my name is Alona Lasheva, and I am editor of Commons Journal and one of the organizers of the conference, The Dialogues of Peripheries. And we're starting now, and I'm going to change to Ukrainian because a uh, big part of our audience is Ukrainian speaking, and also we really want to make this conference as international as possible. Доброго дня! Мене звати Альона Ляшева, я редакторка журналу «Спільне» і співорганізаторка конференції «Діалоги периферій». Сьогодні ми починаємо першу секцію цієї конференції, яку ми ще запланували на початку цього року, коли вирішили, що в цьому році ми присвятимо велику частину нашої роботи такій темі, як вибудовування розмови, діалогу між різними антиімперіалістичними спротивами. Зрозуміло, що це абсолютно непроста тема, тому що більшість способів говорити про антиімперіалістичні спротиви, вони використовують дуже геополітичну логіку. Але ми, як в нашому журналі, так і на цьому івенті хочемо відмовитись від цієї логіки і спробувати поговорити з людьми з різних країн світу, які відчувають ту чи іншу імперіалістичну агресію. І для цього ми організували аж шість панелей, три відбудуться сьогодні, це перша з них, три відбудуться завтра. І я не буду займати багато часу і запрошую до слова модераторку першої панелі Ірину Замуруєву. Будь ласка, Іро, твоє слово. Дякую, Альона. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Irina Zamuroyeva. I am a researcher and artist. I'm working on land uh, across different strands of my work and also land and climate policies. And I'm really honored to be moderating our panel on food sovereignty, war and the environment today. And my hope is that through this panel, we will delve into these complicated relationships between war, environment, the way that food is produced and consumed. And just a bit of an introduction to the panel. Uh, we're dealing with multiple social and ecological crises today. There is wars, there is climate change, there is the destructions of lives, human and non-human, and the devastation of the entire environments. And somewhere amidst all of this, there is also land. There is its life supporting capacity. And there's something that may seem very simple on the surface, food, but there's of course nothing that simple about it, the way it's produced, consumed, governed, at whose cost, for whose benefit. And this is something we'll delve into with our speakers today. We'll look at different conceptual frames, such as food sovereignty, food security, and land justice, and explore both the challenges with the current system, but also look into what are actually more healthy, just and decolonial, uh food systems can look like and today we have four brilliant speakers with us today um i'm going to introduce them uh so first one is uh, natalia mamonova who is a senior researcher at ruralis uh, an institute for rural uh, and regional research in norway her research focuses on rural politics agrarian transformation social movements food sovereignty and right-wing populism in post-socialist rural europe she received her PhD degree from Erasmus University in the Netherlands in 2016, and since then she has been a researcher and lecturer at the Oxford University, the New Europe College in Bucharest, the University of Helsinki, and the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies. And her current research at Ruralis is primarily focused on the impacts of the war in Ukraine on the Ukrainian and global food systems. Uh, second, we have Serge Harfouche with us, who is a farmer, psychology and French literature mentor, uh, environment and food sovereignty activist, and president of the Buzuruna Juzuruna Association in Lebanon. Third up is Andrew Benny, who is a senior researcher in food system and climate policy at the Institute for Economic Justice. 
He has extensive background in food sovereignty, organizing and activism in South Africa, and has also worked in the Africa-wide food sovereignty movement. Andrew has a master's degree in development and environmental sociology from the University of uh, Witwatersrand uh, and a PhD on the agrarian uh, question, collective action from the below and food sovereignty in South Africa. His research expertise is in political economy, land and agrarian studies, food systems and climate justice. And last but not least, we have Fuad Abu Saif with us. Uh, who holds a master's degree in sustainable development and agriculture plant protection. He's a human rights defender, a leader and developer of hundreds of agricultural programs, initiatives and coalitions contributing to the development of the agricultural sector through empowering farmers, steadfastness and sovereignty over resources within a sustainable community-based liberational developmental framework. Fuad was one of the founders of the local Palestinian seed bank. He supported Palestine's membership in La Via Campesina and has played a major role in establishing La Via Campesina's Arab region, North Africa regional work. And Fuad brings farmers' voices to the national policy level, as well as into regional and international arenas. So we have really a fantastic diversity of backgrounds, research, practice. So I think it will be a really amazing discussion. A quick note on the format, uh, each of the speakers will have about 10 minutes to share their insights and experience with food sovereignty, after which we will have a discussion and some time for questions. Uh, please use the chat uh, to ask the questions and feel free to add them as we go so that once the speakers are done with their inputs, we can pick them up right away. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Natalia, and the floor is yours. Oh, okay. Thank you, Irina. Uh, that's a great honor to be here virtually. Um, I hope on one day we all meet in person. And uh, um, so we talk today about the our uh, research on the food sovereignty and our also uh, activism on food sovereignty. And um, I'll start with um, saying that uh, perhaps in Ukraine the food sovereignty is a bit different from what La Via Campesina defines. And uh, just, I know probably most of you are familiar with the uh, main definition of food sovereignty, but I would just repeat it now briefly so that we are on the same page, everyone. So uh, according to the La Via Campesina definition, food sovereignty is uh, the right of peoples to health and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods, and their right to define their own food system and agricultural system. And food sovereignty it puts in, uh, uh, those who produce, distribute, and consume uh, food at the center of food systems and politics, and uh, not the the demands of the market and uh, uh, corporations. So in in some ways, it's like anti-capitalist uh, movement, anti-neoliberal capitalist movement um, that put forward the peasant rights and, and the interest of smallholders and, and, and uh, local uh, networks, food networks. So um, this uh, um, food sovereignty-like uh, practices are quite common in Ukraine, although they're not called as such. There is a long-standing tradition of the food self-provision in Ukraine, and it practiced um, both uh, by rural and uh, by urban population. And uh, talking about the rural uh, population, there are about 5 million rural households um, called in also Bistisilanska Hospodarstvo that produce food for their personal consumption and eventual sales in local markets. And they are they actually produce and uh, following this food sovereignty um, um, ideas, although they don't call it uh, as such, and uh, they produce it in an environmentally friendly way. They follow local customs and cultural traditions. They uh, draw on uh, local networks and uh, reciprocity, and they're quite uh, um, their production is quite substantial uh, in terms of the. Um, the, the scale, you know, according to the recent statistics before the war statistics, and uh, the rural households produced about 95% of potatoes, 85% of vegetables, 80% of fruits and berries, 75% of milk, and more than 35% of meat produced in country in total. However, their important role in domestic food security is often overlooked by the state, uh, which uh, prioritized and uh, their a large-scale industrial export-oriented agriculture in its vision of, of agricultural development. But it's not only urban or rural uh, dwellers, as I said, it's also urban 
uh, people who grow their own food on uh, Dutch allotments and, and, and uh, on their orchard gardens in, in suburban areas. And depending on the social economic situation, this small scale farming could be a safety net and then play an important role in family subsistence. Or in the best of the times, uh, it can be a more the hobby farming or the source of healthy self grown food. So, um, Food self-provisioning uh, has a long history and is widely practiced in the Ukrainian society. However, the major difference between the La Via Campesina version of food sovereignty and Ukrainian food sovereignty um, is that the Ukrainian one is not accompanied by rights discourse, uh, as I said in the beginning of the definition, it's the rights of people. So it doesn't have this discourse on the rights and it doesn't have uh, uh, social mobilization around these food uh, matters. Uh, Ukrainian people don't talk about their food practices as their fundamental rights and they don't engage in any social movement to defend this right and to defend their way of life. So it's just a part of their you know, everyday life and it's not considered something special. And you know, my colleagues and I call this type of food sovereignty as a quiet food sovereignty or food sovereignty without a movement. And it's practiced not only in Ukraine, but it's also in other post-socialist societies of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And uh, here the Soviet legacy or socialist legacy plays an, an important role uh, in uh, the absence of the discourse and mobilization around food practices. Because in Soviet times, in, uh, household food production was considered as a backward or inefficient it's rather a subsidiary to large-scale industrial agriculture, and um, unfortunately, uh, it's it continued to be in see, seen as such, especially in state policies. Uh, but their societal discourse, uh, I mean, general population discourse about uh, food practices in, in Ukraine start uh, changing since the Euro Maidan revolution. At least I, in my research, I noticed that as a turning point. Maybe it started changing earlier. Uh, so I did a study on the changes in social imaginary of small scale farming in Ukraine. It was based on the interviews that I conducted in 2000. Uh, 12 and 2016, it's a two years before and two years after the Euromaidan revolution, and the article is called and Patriotism and Food Sovereignty, and, and Irina will share right now their link to it, if you're interested. And I wanted to see how the Euromaidan revolution, followed by the Russian annexation of Crimea and the war in Eastern Ukraine influence the ways people talk about farming. And I found out that the uh, rising pro-European patriotic sentiments in Ukraine and the redefinition of national identity in opposition to the Soviet past, uh, all this influenced the societal discourse about household farming. It's no longer seen as a backward and inefficient relic of their socialist past, which is doomed to disappear in the nearest future. And more and more people uh, started uh, talking about household farming, small-scale farming as a sustainable alternative to large-scale industrial agriculture that could uh, feed Ukraine and Europe at extension uh, with ecological healthy food. It's actually also in 2016, there was a discussion about an association agreement between EU and Ukraine. So their uh, European future of Ukraine was a uh, very, um, uh, very important topic at that time, at least and nowadays as well, of course. So, but this, nevertheless, the discourses has changed, but the movement didn't emerge. And so now we, the, the full war, full scale war started and uh, it did change uh, a lot. And I did, uh, as Serena mentioned, uh, that I am doing this now research on how the Russia's war in Ukraine impacts the Ukrainian uh, agriculture and so looking at the small farms and the large industrial agribusiness. And of course, the impact is, in, uh, is, is huge and, and, and disastrous, but um, you know that like I will not go into the all uh, this horrible thing that happened, and uh, but you know this Russia's attacks on Ukrainian agriculture, their shelling of agricultural facilities, infrastructure, use of uh, land miles, burning farmlands and near the zones of the of the active hostilities, and of course the blockade of the Black Sea ports. They have severely disrupted the production, uh, uh, agricultural production in Ukraine. And the, the most affected were the uh, large industrial agribusiness, which is primarily specialized in the production of grain for export. And uh, also the, their model is quite an, uh, uh, not resilient and not an, uh, able to quickly adapt to the war-related destructions because uh, they're too big and uh, too complex. And uh, this was a paper uh, Irina now shared, and it 
was on the corn producers in Ukraine. My colleagues and I recently published it in the Journal of Peasant Studies. So that's where we talk about you know, uh, large-scale agriculture, how it experienced the first year of the war. And uh, so while their uh, large-scale agriculture was paralyzed, small-scale uh, food producers were able to adapt quickly and produce food for their families, for their communities, for internally displaced persons, and also for the Ukrainian army. And uh, this is like the study which I would like to draw your attention. Uh, it's, uh, this is an, an, another one that Irina just uh, shared, the Food Sovereignty and Solidarity Initiatives in rural Ukraine. It's where I looked at uh, uh, how the uh, small-scale farmers and, uh, adapted to the hardship and dangers of the war. And of course, the small-scale food producers are less dependent on international trade and the external resources, so they suffered less from the war-related destructions. But of course, they're you know the the in comparison with with a large and uh, agribusiness, and but nevertheless, of course, it's in a um, a lot of you know, problems, and I will not go into the details. I don't have time for that. But what, like, what I want to say here, it's not only the resilience and adaptation, which was important for me as a uh, food sovereignty scholar, but also the massive wave of uh, solidarity and collection, collective action that emerged during the war in Ukraine. And uh, people helped each other. They shared the fuel, they shared the seeds, they uh, shared other farm inputs. Uh, this made them more resilient, and this is the, this is what made them uh, being able to feed themselves and the country despite all that hardship. And solidarity went beyond that. Uh, so, for example, many family farmers in rural households they host internally displaced persons. You know, there are currently now uh, more than five million displaced persons in the country. And many of them flee the zones of active military operations and uh, large cities. Uh, large cities are often the target of the Russian um, missiles. So people come to rural areas because it's safe there. And they often engage in subsistence farming and help local uh, farmers uh, with different kinds of things. And also uh, people in urban areas, you know, they started growing more food to deal with the food shortages and the rising food prices. And there are many initiatives aimed at supporting those who would like to set up a mini garden on their balconies, on apartment roofs, in yards, in city parks. One of such initiatives is the Victory Garden, Sadi Pirimohi, which is largely inspired by the Victory Garden movement in several Western countries during the First and Second World War. And Victory Gardens, they are not only to help people to produce their own food, but also to raise their spirit and the hope for the victory. And you know, some uh, uh, people whom I interviewed, they said that the war, despite all its horrible impacts, you know, has revitalized the Ukrainian village and gave the boost to small-scale food production. And this is perhaps the moment when the food sovereignty movement emerged in Ukraine, in a way how we're imagining you know, that movement. People recognize the uh, vital importance of the small-scale farming for the survival of the country and Ukrainian people, and they are ready to mobilize for it. And uh, now, uh, because Irina asked us also to finish with the biggest challenges, let me finish with the biggest challenge for food sovereignty in Ukraine these days. Um, this, um, this research we've done with other uh, group of my colleagues, and uh, we studied uh, Ukrainian agricultural policies during the war and the post-war recovery programs. As the report is not published yet, it will be published just in a few days on the 7th of November by Transnational Institute, so keep eyes open for that, and I think there will be a good report. The policies that we analyze, they, uh, they are largely oriented at supporting and helping to recover the large-scale export-oriented agriculture in Ukraine. And um, so we don't really argue that, you know, it's the wrong thing to do, and we're not against the export-oriented agriculture. But what we argue is that the more attention should be given to small-scale farming because they are those who feed Ukrainian people during the war and they will feed the country with health and culture appropriate food after Ukraine wins the war. So there, there are those who are the future, but they, you know, there's not enough support uh, from the government that comes to them. And the very, very last thing, just before I finish, sorry, I'm going a little bit beyond the time. It's a little announcement. The Ukrainian Academy of Science, uh, the Association of Farmers and Private Landowners of Ukraine, and some other organizations that represent the interest of uh, smallholders in Ukraine, they organized International Forum on Peasants' Rights in Ukraine 
and it will take place on 12th of December this year in Kyiv and online. Uh, I don't have the link to the event yet, but if you're interested, and I think it will be a very good uh, uh, event, and uh, please send email uh, to me and I will get you in touch with the organizers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. That was brilliant. And I think that is such an important moment in time that we're witnessing this emergence of Ukrainian food sovereignty as a movement, kind of recognizing itself, it, itself as a power, as a force. Uh, it would be fantastic to hear from other speakers uh, who have more of a tradition of the movement uh, um, in their places, what we can learn from each other. Um, I'm going to hand over to the next speaker, uh, Serge. The uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure uh, the sounds works well. Works, we can hear perfect. well. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I, it might cut off at some points. The internet is, uh, yeah, approximative, but uh, yeah, let's go for, for it. Uh, just to give some context uh, first, the, uh, food, the word and the concept of food sovereignty is relatively new in Lebanon. So uh, it, uh, as Natalia has said, uh, the quiet uh, food sovereignty is more of was what was happening back in the day when Lebanon was still mostly a rural uh, society and the movement towards the city was not uh, starting yet. So we're talking about the 60s, 50s, 60s, uh, 70s, somewhere around there. And at that point, there was this practice of uh, everyone in the village producing their own food, being able to share the seeds and uh, and the production, etc. So the uh, the articulation of the production was very different from where we are now. Uh, right now in Lebanon, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna uh, let's say uh, talk uh, between 2019 and 2023. This is where the talk. Uh, about food sovereignty has uh, begun to go mainstream and people started uh, feeling uh, the interest and the importance and the emergency of it. So there were two main factors that played into that. First, there was the 17th October uh, 2019, the revolution, which uh, had very mitigated results, but did start something in the sense that people were uh, finally in the street talking to each other. And this is where the urgency and the priority uh, started to uh, emerge and be talked about. So this is the phase where uh, people, uh, common people, anyone, not people living in rural areas, people maybe from the city, from all kinds of uh, class and uh, and trade, who were starting to feel the worry uh, of food, food shortages. Because at the same time as the uh, revolution was uh, underway and then the counter-revolution uh, blasted down on us uh, uh, the the main problem was the shortage was the uh, accessibility uh, of food so we were not talking mostly sovereignty but more security and uh, at the same time there was the uh, the economic collapse that was on the way so uh, basically Lebanon lost uh, many many uh, times the the value of its uh, currency so to give you an example before 2019 uh, a US dollar or one euro was around uh, 1500 Lebanese pounds now it's around 89,000 Lebanese pounds so it's uh, uh, a deterioration that changed everything on the ground and uh, that made people think suddenly that, oh, uh, we are mostly uh, dependent on imports, which means that uh, at any point we don't have the currency or we don't have the capacity to import our food, we are completely screwed. And this is mainly the main two factors. But then there, there's also uh, other uh, uh, other factors that are a bit wider than the Lebanese situation. So there's the Syrian revolution, then the war, uh, then the sieges on many cities and the experience of living under siege and having the emergency of feeding everyone. And there's the experience of the uh, Yarmouk camp in 
in the out, outskirts of Damascus that uh, showed us it was extremely important to have at least the basic of our food production in order uh, in order basically not to starve. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there is always the Palestinian experience under the occupation and the dependence on uh, on everything that is imposed by the occupation and how uh, going towards food sovereignty is also going towards uh, national sovereignty as in an independence uh, uh, and autonomization kind of uh, uh, movement let's say so basically this is for for lebanon very quickly uh we import 90 percent of uh of our uh of our food uh, we depend on russia and ukraine for uh, the wheat for example and we produce maybe uh, i can't remember the numbers correctly but it is somewhere around 100,000 tons and then we import around 600 to 700,000 tons so uh, the scales of uh, of production and uh, ability to pr produce vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, imports are huge and so we had this crisis uh, around two summers ago uh, the bread crisis and there was no more access to flour for making bread and the problem in that case was not the price or the availability. It was the price, uh, the problem of monopoly. So basically in Lebanon, we have this third factor as well, which is that the regime is basically uh, some kind of hybrid oligarchy where uh, a few people are in control of uh, most of the sectors. So uh, let's say energy is controlled by uh, one or two people, uh, one or two companies, uh, food import is another one, etc., etc. So basically at that point, uh, a few people decided to make more money uh, while using the economic collapse to uh, uh, to benefit from uh, from the state uh, subsidies and funds, uh, it's a very complex and long story. But basically, some very few people had the access to the wheat and the flour, and they kept it until they got subsidies, and then they sold it at higher prices and made two profits from two uh, from the sales and from the subsidies this is very uh, very quickly so basically uh, food sovereignty in lebanon is a very new idea uh, it is very linked to our ability as a people to have autonomy uh, and to have agency over our future because for the past 40 maybe 50 years there's always been uh, warlords uh, in control of uh, the country and then warlords raided their uh, their fighting gear uh, for uh, you know ties and uh, and suits and got into the government and so uh, it was it got even more complex to actually be able to do anything to be creative to be at least uh, in control of our own futures and uh, with the economic uh, problematic before 2019 and everything coming together, uh, the explosion of the uh, of the revolution uh, the first uh, two three months uh, showed that there were priorities among the people. Uh, first, uh, getting uh, our agency over our lives back, and second, getting our agency over our food. So these are two related subjects. And this is where uh, we come in as a very small association, Buzuruna uh, Juzuruna, which means our seeds, our roots. Uh, and uh, basically, we started with a very small dream, which was to just bring back the uh, uh, endemic varieties that were planted in the region, specifically weeds, because they come from Bilad al-Sham and, uh, and uh, Iraq. Uh, and through that, maybe uh, find a way. We were like six, seven people. It was a very, very small thing. And the idea was to just uh, make them available in the sense that these are peasant seeds, which are reproducible, which means that they are not controlled by the patents of uh, great seed, uh, big seed uh, uh, corporations. So this is uh, 
mainly the small the small uh, start of it and then very quickly we uh, we we realized that uh, bringing seeds is not enough producing seeds is not enough so uh, the idea was uh, was then born was to transmit the practice of agroecology and uh, heirloom seed production at the same time which uh, answered many uh, problematics at the same time which means that uh, uh, there was the whole uh, soil degradation the whole pollution by by, pesti by pesticides and uh, and chemical pesticides and uh, and chemical entrants inputs as a whole so everything started to look very much intertwined we had the need and the urgency for food sovereignty uh, which meant that we needed to have uh, the peasant uh, reproducible seeds at hand and we were able to reproduce them uh, and then spreading that knowledge in order to close the whole uh, the whole uh, link and structure i say so uh, this is where we are around 2016 2017 and then there was the revolution and then we figured out that uh, actually this is something that could be spread out because there is still uh, knowledge that exists in the villages in the rural areas where people still produce small quantities of uh, of their own so basically uh, this is where we started going around the country which is a very very small country for those who don't know it's uh it's 10,000 square kilometers so it's like that big uh, uh, compared to uh, uh bigger plains like ukraine let's say so uh, uh one might think that it's a lot easier to achieve uh, something on this small scale but then we have the problematics of the mountains and the uh the political separation because of the civil war and many other uh, uh, many other difficulties, let's say. So uh, what we faced first uh, was to find the knowledge back. The ancestral knowledge was completely gone. We have a gap of two or three generations between those who was who were working the land. Uh, oh, I need to wrap up. Okay, I'm going to go very quick. Sorry. Uh, so the, the main challenges were to find uh, this knowledge and bring it back. And the other one was to make sure that the seeds that we were talking about were actually peasant seeds, not F1s uh, that were uh, in a way or another uh, lost in the in this chaos. And uh, yeah, I'm going to stop here now. I think uh, I took too much time. I hope it was clear. Thank you. Yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. And I think what you were saying about food sovereignty being people's sovereignty is it resonates strongly with a lot of people in Ukraine. It's not just about food, obviously, and another side of it that the war and um, all of these crises, they're never just about these material losses, but the losses of knowledge of how to produce food in ecologically and socially sound ways. Uh, and when people who hold those knowledge die and are killed in the wars, uh, the knowledge is gone, of course. There's just so many layers of this that, yeah, I hope we can also talk a little bit more um, afterwards. Um, we're going to move on to our third speaker, uh, Andrew. Um, over to you. Thanks, Serena. Um, and thanks very much for this uh, convening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with the uh, fellow panelists and and audience and so on. And I think also important to be here speaking with and learning from uh, comrades who are in or linked to uh, you know the heart of anti-imperialist struggles at the moment in the war in Ukraine um, and the situation in Palestine. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, just to also show my solidarity, especially with in terms of sharing a panel with a Palestinian comrade. Um, in the context of this terrible situation. Um, so yeah, I'm going to speak briefly from uh, where I'm at at the moment, the South African context. Um, but I also want to just briefly start, I think, in terms of the, the topic of this panel um, and the wider continent that um, uh, uh, I'm on, Africa. Um, so I think, you know, to start the speaking to the Russia-Ukraine war um, <clears throat> before coming to the South African context is... Uh, you know, there's obviously, as some of the speakers mentioned, one of the biggest um, worries when Russia invaded Ukraine was the fears of, of wheat shortage and rising food prices. And especially in the African context, where much of Africa is highly dependent on food imports, especially of grains like wheat and maize and so on. Um, there was a big, uh, a lot of worry about the rising food crisis. Um, 
but I think the you know how it ended up playing out points to some of the key dynamics of the global food system around corporate control in that actually um despite the the expected crisis the supply consistently has remained above demand according to FAO statistics supply of grains um yet still there's been rising especially rising food prices and rising hunger especially in sub-saharan Africa and I think you know it points to at the same time that um the the dynamics causing hunger today aren't just for example the Russia Ukraine war but the structure of the global food economy but also how um, for example, from my context, how African countries are positioned in that global structure and some of the contradictions of their food systems within their countries um, that exist and, and that underpin hunger, even without the, the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, so as I said, you know, supply remained above demand um, during the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, but the, the ABCD global grain traders, the four global grain traders that control 70% of the trade, um, their profits soared during uh, uh, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, and in and so what and what that translated into while those profits were soaring is it was rising hunger in sub-Saharan Africa especially, but it spoke largely to constraints on where I mentioned that Africa is very um, dependent on importing food from the global economy. Um, much of Africa uh speaks to constraints on importing in africa so declining exports in africa meant low for lower foreign exchange revenues for which to pay for food imports um, monetary tightening in especially places like the us and rising interest rates meant capital flight as capital sought um higher interest rates in in those economies um which then left 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 capital left less capital in in africa to to import and also the 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 big issue at the moment, the debt servicing costs. Um, and I think these are some of the key features of Africa's relationship with the global economy that's undermining food sovereignty on the continent and the ability to to address hunger. Um, just quickly also, um, but also I think it also speaks to some of the historical and structural limits that exist to self-sufficiency, which mean that still much of Africa has to import so much food. Um, and I think that lies in in the kind of um, what some have called the disarticulation between uh, agriculture and industry in African countries that began under colonialism but were actually entrenched in the post-colonial um, development trajectories and then obviously reinforced by structural adjustment. And now we have this whole, because of this sort of low productivity, lack of development in African agriculture, it's used as an excuse for now marketized neoliberal agri-food development approaches. And these in themselves, research has shown, aren't addressing hunger. So my, my my point is just to point to these whole layers of contradictions in kind of corporate controlled and market driven food systems, and hence, of course, the, the importance of food sovereignty. So in this context, in the South African context is, in the African context, a bit unusual in the sense that we have a, a highly kind of modernized, large scale, commercialized um, food system, um, very industrialized food system, very large scale. Um, and it's also uh, controlled by uh, quite a small number of companies uh, at each step of the value chain. But that's also, there's a strong racialized dimension to that control because of our colonial and apartheid history. Uh, so in, in terms of some of the, the, the context in South Africa, um, I'll get to the fact that we have very high rates of hunger and malnutrition and some of the highest child stunting in the world. But one of the big contradictions of our food system is that we actually produce Number one, we produce way more than we consume and that we need. So we export a lot. Our food system is very globally integrated. But also we we not just produce, but mass produce a very wide variety of foods, a huge variety of fruits, vegetables, grains, um, just about everything you can think of. Um, so in that sense, we're also quite self-sufficient. But the the agriculture system is also very marketized and globalized. Um so there's a very unequal production and ownership structure. So um, the like I mentioned earlier, we have on the one hand 40, about 40,000 large scale, mostly white commercial farmers producing most of our food. And then on the other hand, we have about 2.5 million, mostly black small scale farmers squeezed onto about 13% of the land, whereas 40,000 um, commercial farmers control about 80% of agricultural land. Um, <clears throat> And so already there's this very racialized, but also class-based um, inequality in land ownership and agricultural production. And it's also very gendered and raced. So 
like small scale farmers, 2.3 million of them or 2.5 million only have access to about 20% of irrigation water. And of that only about 5% are women um, that have access to um, water rights. Um, so linked to that also then is despite this, you know, we like I said, we produce this wide array of food, high levels of food, um, but we also have very high levels of inequality in consumption and nutrition. So about 25, 25 so over a quarter of 25%, over a quarter of households in South Africa are um, food insecure. And about 60% of households can't afford a nutritious diet, despite the array of nutritious food that the country produces. And obviously, this inequality in the food system is linked to the widest societal inequality in South Africa. We have the world, according to the World Bank, we're the most unequal country of the world in the world. And this is seen in the food system as well. Something also that still continues to define the food system is, um, despite being very profitable, especially in the last few years, the, the, the agricultural sector has been growing um, and thriving while other sectors of the economy have been stagnating. Um, but there's, in terms of worker organization and class organization, unfortunately, it's quite weak. So um, on farms and farm work, which the farm work employs about, depends on, on the year and sees that it employs roughly 860,000 people as farm laborers. Um, but organization amongst farm workers has historically been very low, and I won't get into the reasons because of the sake of time, but also in, in agro-processing um, sectors. Uh, where traditionally there were high levels of unionization in the 1990s, um, unionization was about 70% due to corporate strategies and flexibilization of work and so on. Unionization in agro-processing and food manufacturing is down to about 27%. Um, so these are speaking to also to some of the challenges that Irina also asked us to speak to. I think I just want to quickly briefly mention um, the ecological question. Um, so, you know, globally, food systems are one of the largest sources of the emissions causing climate change, industrial food systems, um, and that's also um, a factor in South Africa. It's a bit lower than a third because we have a very dirty coal-fired um, energy system, so that takes up the bulk of our emissions, um, but it makes a, quite a significant contribution to climate change. But also at the same time, the, the food system in South Africa is really vulnerable to climate change. So if Southern Africa is a climate change hotspot, which means it'll heat at double the global average. So if, if global temperatures continue up to two degrees Celsius, um, global warming, the Southern African region will warm by four degrees Celsius. And that has massive implications for food production, for um, livestock and so on, but obviously also then for farm workers, for example, as as they directly impacted by these weather changes, but also as farmers adjust their economic strategies to cope with these impacts and pass costs on to farm workers. So I just very briefly in terms of then, you know, this is some of the context of the food system in South Africa. Uh, some of the work that we're doing, working with social movements and civil society and trade union organizations and very platforms of workers is to try create more of a create more connection across this wide variety of constituencies smallholder farmers farm workers food workers informal traders in the informal economy selling food um food justice civil society organizations trade unions and so on there hasn't really existed the solidarity on any significant extent in terms of action and organization across these sectors. So we're working with a host of different organizations to try and build this um, um, sort of consensus uh, around food system transformation. And we're the, the kind of frame we're working in is um, drawing on food sovereignty principles, but bringing it into um, discussions on the just transition in South Africa as well. So food system just transition. I think just quickly to say the kind of terrain that we're operating on is um, we the what we've identified in in the paper. Oh, I see two minutes. Um, okay, I'll start trying to wrap up. Um, the we work in a terrain where where there's a very the strongest thrust in the context of the ecological crisis. There's awareness of the need to shift our food system, but policy at the government level is very biased towards agri business. I mean, it's very market-centered. And so the dominant thrust is that we need to address ecological issues through essentially ecological modernization. So we must continue to grow sectors in the economy and agri agricultural sectors, especially export sectors, uh, but we must do some technology to green it a bit. Um, there are then um, different um, thrusts to, to green the food system more deeply, but they don't take into account 
social relations necessarily, like, for example, the labor relations on farms. There's then food justice and food sovereignty perspectives, um, but those are relatively, there's a lot of organizing happening, but in relation to the overall structure of the food system, those are, are quite marginal. So we, I'm, I'm rushing over here so that I think that paper that maybe Rena shared covers these this terrain. Um, so if you're interested in more, you can look there. But basically we we to 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 develop like a common platform of action, we've we've been working on a process, like I say, with a, a set of other movements and organizations to develop a common just transition framework um for the food system in South Africa. Um and again, I, I could speak to it, but I know we're running very short of time. But basically it involves a participatory and deliberative process of agreeing on principles that uh for food system change. That are common across these very different constituencies so at the level of principles that can um, be one aspect of building a shared agenda and then also talking about deliberately de de deliberatively okay what does it mean in practice to achieve that principle um, across different constituencies and then moving that, that on to the next level of then what are the demands that we work around in order to realize those indicators and those principles um i feel like there's a lot i haven't covered uh, but hopefully that's sufficient for the 10 minutes we had uh, and looking forward to further discussion. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Andrea. I think, yeah, you draw such important attention to a wider historical context of food sovereignty, the kind of the, all the hunger that we're talking about. It didn't just appear out of the blue, right? We need to learn to see it as the consequences of colonialism, of all of these processes, which often are depoliticized when the the issues are framed just around reducing poverty or reducing hunger, kind of that political dimension is missing. So it's really, really important that you bring that in. Um, we're going to move to our uh, final speaker uh, today. Uh, for, uh, it's yeah, an honor to have you here. Over to you. OK, hello, everyone. Thank you very much, actually, for giving us the chance to talk in actually in very in critical moment at Palestine. You know what's going on in, in Palestine these days. I will try to give first a brief about the situation because it's totally 100% linked to the subject of this conference. And after that, we'll try to يعني, give you an, uh, somehow uh, also a details about what we uh, mean by food sovereignty in Palestine and what exactly the food system that we are trying to apply to confront this situation, which is like uh, the whole context when it comes to food sovereignty. When you are under occupation, it's totally different than any other countries when you have your own uh, independency and access to your resources. Um, Already, I think everyone is aware that Israel uh, waging um, a genocide war against the Palestinians in uh, Gaza and West Bank since now 29 days, and until now, and this morning, and until this morning, they killed more than 9,300 Palestinians and more than 35,000 injured, and the all 1969 of them is women and children, and the air strike is continuing, like in, in 24 hours. And from the moment that we started this conference until now, as the Palestinian hospitals declared it's just less than one hour, we lost 60 Palestinians. They already get killed. Most of them in the hospital, they attack again to another hospitals in uh, in Gaza. Uh, it's in this insane, like uh, Israeli government and uh, war against the people in Gaza where we have 2.5 million stuck in Gaza and they put them in, in uh, since 16 years in siege is like something we cannot describe what's going on and the whole um, horrific scenes for from Gaza is like something you cannot even uh, describe uh, children were killed in, and and bombed in uh, in very shame uh, like way they destroyed everything they attacking like hospitals streets how houses and and they declare that they have around uh, in each night in 24 hours they have around 400 targets all of that is civilians and houses they just target houses um and they are using linked to our like subject they are using like starvation as a weapon against the people in Gaza. They um, are really like uh, violating the ban of using like uh, starvation 
in, in war against the people, and this is what Israel is doing. And the next day of the war, the Israeli Minister of Defense declared officially uh, that they cut the water, they cut the food, they cut the electricity, no more food, no more access to the land planted in area C, in, in area C on West Bank or in, in buffer zone in Gaza were allowed, and they will do whatever needed to prevent the Palestinians and uh, the producers here, because most of the areas they declare it as a military zone area, especially in the north, uh, north in the middle of uh, Gaza, is like where we produce food. We have around 100,000 tons of food is now uh, isolated from the from the people uh, in Gaza, where the people, hundred percent of the people in Gaza need food insecure, and they need an aid immediately, uh, aid in particular water and 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 food. Um, so this, it's even difficult to describe uh, that you already have the food in, in Gaza. It's in in the farms and all over uh, Gaza, but no one allowed to enter and to harvest their farms to ha having an access, which we call it now preventing the, the sovereignty of the people from having access to their like uh, food. Uh, fishing like sector in Gaza really destroyed. They attacking all the boats, all the fishing and in, in the, um, uh, Gaza during the 30 days. And they focused and intensive uh, attacking the the whole agricultural land, and this is again using like uh, the food as weapon. Uh, for us, the definition of the food sovereignty as a Palestinian is a bit or, uh, even different, because we believe it's like uh, very far from having like um, link between uh, food security and food sovereignty. Food security is something like focused on aid comes from outside, whereas the Palestinians we need to design and we already designed our own food sovereignty definition, which is about dignity, about steadfastness, about having and fighting and struggling against this occupation. And this is one of the important tools that you uh, should use while you're designing your food system uh, in order to confront, to, to confront this kind of like uh, special occupation because this occupation is, is totally different than even in the history when we read and hear about the other uh, occupation for something like this. So we're doing actually uh, as an organization, as an activist, as even as a Palestinians, try to design our own food system in different uh, way. For example, uh, in West Bank, which is like a bit different than Gaza, but also where we have more than 90% of our agricultural land located where we can uh, produce our uh, food, it's also uh, Israel is isolated and preventing the Palestinians from having access to the resources. 99% of our resources is located in area C, where Israel again prevented and building the settlements there and having like more than 500 checkpoints to cut and to prevent any continuation between the people in area in, in, in the Palestinian communities and cities and to, to the land where we have to produce our food. So to manage and to adapt with, with very com complicated situation like that, you have to design your own weapons, as we call it. So for example, one of the, of the very uh, practical examples that we succeeded as an organization to, to have, which is the seed bank. Uh, we established our own seed bank in, in, 2000, uh, in 20, 2010, in 2010, sorry. And uh, we succeeded to collect and protect around 60 uh, different priorities from our uh, own seed, which is uh, totally and fully adapted with our climate and, and land here since hundreds of years. And we start distributing, distributing that to the farmers from time to time to be sure that the farmers have an access to their food by producing that by themselves in their land, in their home, uh, in their areas. Nowadays, for example, from this, when the, when when the, this war took place like a month ago, even in West Bank, where Israel uh, applying and committing ethnical uh, cleansing against the, the, the Palestinians, uh, it's forbidden for the Palestinians to leave their areas, homes, villages, hamlets, even uh, to go to their lands to harvest even the the, the farms that you already uh, planted. And uh, we start, for example, I myself now stuck in my area, which is in Hebron. I cannot even 
go outside two kilo from here because if you go and arrive to that checkpoint which is surrounding all the cities here you might uh, they might uh, shoot you yesterday alone they killed nine uh, 11 sorry palestinians in west Bank. so all the farmers all the producers we have uh, hundreds of thousands of farmers in west bank and gaza they are all under threat and it's not allowed now for them to enter their land in in hundred percent the israel is preventing that and, and declare that uh, what that mean that means that they don't want the people to have any um, tools that they can use to increase their resilience and uh, struggle against the occupation. They weaken the Palestinian in the way that uh, using the food in very shameful way to uh, let them just uh, survive. Using this starvation and in, in the way that uh, you don't have food to your families. I have the chance, for example, uh, to talk to our team in Gaza. Again, we are all agronomists, and even our team in Gaza, they are agronomists and farmers. We, we work in producing food here or there in West Bank and in Gaza. They're describing the situation even in, the, in, in their families. They don't have, they, they said, we don't have a threat. We don't have an access to water. We use a very dirty water. While at the same time, we have next to us our farm and greenhouses is full of food, full of vegetables. If you try, to enter that area, you will be um, died. They will, uh, the Israeli uh, airstrike will attack you immediately. And from the first moment until now, from the first moment of this war, they, we, we succeeded to account around 70 uh, of our farmers were get killed while they're trying to bring food from their farms um, next to their houses, not, not, not that far. Uh, a real exa another example um, for the food sovereignty and how we try to adapt our uh, food system while having all this kind of like um, challenges uh, is like the only source of food in gas right now because as you as you know it's uh, the embossed uh, siege and even the only gate to lead to uh, Rafah uh, Egypt is also closed and they allowed some few, few, few like uh, trucks to enter, which is like uh, uh, not covering 1% uh, from their need. Uh, the only source of food is like the food that the Palestinians planted next to their houses, that, which is, we call it the home garden. This is the only food they have, which is very limited, very few, not sufficient to cover the whole need of the 2.5 million of the Palestinians, with all of them 100 years of the community. So this is the only so, which means that okay, under occupation, you have to design your, your own system, which is um, uh, benefiting and using as we always declare to the farmer when we give them like some instructions and extension how we can uh, adapt with the with this kind of like uh, violation and uh, and division and even settlement in, in different areas. You have we have to be sure that we are producing our food. Uh, by our own, using each single life, even centimeters of land that we have an access to. Because this will be the only source of food later on when we have this kind of like direct confrontation with the, uh, this like uh, Israel. And this is what's going on in Gaza. Imagine that the only food that the people have right now is these like uh, very limited lands uh, that they planted before the war and they are using that. The other even some things that you are not using, uh, that you are not, uh, you have the food here, but you cannot even have an access to that uh, to that food. Uh, that being said, I think um, the, the, this is uh, something you you cannot just describe as well. Uh, the challenges also, is, uh, as you um, really requested, that the, the other challenges is like it's not just preventing, but also the confiscated of the land in, in, in Palestine is like going in very, in very wider and, and uh, more than 63 of, of West Bank were really taken by the Israelis and they did settlements and settlers is, is, is in everywhere here. And uh, also we don't have an access to water. Israel took like 95% of our water. Uh, we have only access to less than 5% of the water and you know agriculture without water will be a mess. And uh, that's another like way of, 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 of challenge that we have to deal with. This is why we're developing our 
uh, adapted local seeds, which depending uh, totally on the rain fit, we don't need to irrigate that. And we partially, we, we, we succeeded to have and to develop uh, around, as I said, 60% of, uh, six, sorry, 60 uh, different varieties of different uh, local seeds um, that really in, in, in the hand of the, of the farmer. Um, in addition to all of that, uh, climate change is another challenge. We don't have enough water. Uh, rain is like delayed and the sea, winter season is delayed, like there's a shifting in the season. Uh, it's supposed to have like a uh, winter season in, in, in October, now we, uh, until now we, we received nothing uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's like shifting to December and um, the winter season is started in, in, in that. So um, I'm, I'm sorry, um, maybe the story is a bit different. I wish that I could share some other like uh, examples and stories and experience that we had. Uh, so far to develop our own food system and uh, struggle for food sovereignty in Palestine. But uh, that, that, uh, the, the reality in Palestine, you, uh, when you are in the division, when you are under war, you have to design a different type of life and, and mission to continue your struggle and feed your people and try to work in very hard situation until you, you have your own like a system and you present it to your people in your country. Finally, we, with all this kind of support come to Israel uh, from everywhere, uh, against the Palestinians, the civilians in Gaza, there is like having actually nothing to to to, to, to defend themselves. So they are in siege 16 years ago, uh, ago before this war uh, itself. Anyway. Um, with that, I took more time. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope like, uh, we will have some uh, questions and be answered later. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, dear. Yeah, as you say, it is incredibly painful, but in that ever so important to hear all of this and to yeah learn how we can build solidarities and support each other. Um, I would just like to ask all of the attendees uh, to please drop your questions to the speakers into the chat, uh, or you can also direct uh, message them to me. Uh, we have some attendees who are live, uh, not on Zoom, but yet yeah, just type your questions in the comments uh, and we will collect them and pass on to the speakers. Uh, we have just uh, under 20 minutes um, for question and answers, and uh, I'm going to use a, a moderator privilege to ask a couple of questions while we're collecting those from the audience. Uh, first, perhaps it would be good to maybe have a go round to give our panelists a chance to respond to one another. This is the first time that we are gathered in such a constellation. I think it's just such an incredible diversity of experiences, of context, and yet very, very clear parallels of uh, uh, what, yeah, what resisting the encroachment of large scale agricultural businesses looks like, the resist resisting the imperial powers, land grabbing uh, and preventing uh, life from taking place. So yeah, I would just like to invite all the speakers to comment uh, on each other's inputs uh, and maybe specifically on what kind of uh, resistance strategies that you've heard you find most effective uh, and yeah, resisting the this globalized agricultural uh, food production. Um, we could uh, go in the same, same order, Natalia, perhaps you would like to start. Right. Um, thank you. Yes. Uh, while listening to my colleagues in, uh, uh, today, I was thinking about the uh, several of you mentioned the uh, seed sovereignty. And I think it's such an important um, element of food sovereignty and of uh, uh, food security and all this, uh, you know, sustaining the livelihoods of people. And I was thinking uh, back uh, about the Ukrainian case and, and in the seed um, uh, question also is uh, quite uh, highly important and highly political as well, especially it's seen now during uh, the war, because in the very beginning of the war, uh, many farmers experienced uh, uh, the shortage of uh, different farm inputs, uh, including seeds. And um, their um, seeds that many of the commercial farmers using are patented, so you can't really reproduce them uh, at your farm, so you have to every time buy. 
And um, interesting thing, what my colleagues and I, we uh, observed and uh, uh, what's going on in Ukraine these days is uh, uh, the Monsanto. You probably all know about this and uh, mega company that now it's a buyer. Um, but it, the largest in the plant uh, of Monsanto seeds is located in Zhitomir, my actually native town, and it produces a lot of seeds. And Monsanto now is um, distributing its seeds to farmers for free uh, as a part of their uh, charitable uh, campaigns. And, but, you know, knowing the uh, Monsanto reputation, I would... Uh, I guess it's rather their spread, their their influence in the further beyond those uh, established clients of Monsanto to make more farmers addicted to those seeds. And, and uh, so, I mean, that uh, even so, we are talking right now about resilience and resistance. And uh, there's uh, the other side, and, uh, you know, this and, uh, neoliberal uh, um, agricultural business also not, uh, you know, uh, sleeping it. They do, they use the moment to um, to spread their um, power and influence. And um and also talking about the seeds in Ukraine, uh, and uh, Olivia Campesina is doing a lot on that topic, and especially a very strong partner of Ukraine uh, currently is uh, a Romanian uh, uh, movement and of food sovereignty, Eco Ruraris. And the, these uh, people, uh, they share the Eco Ruraris is famous for its uh, seed sovereignty for producing the local seed varieties, and they now sending a lot of their seeds it's to Ukrainian smallholders and uh, family farmers. Those seeds that the farmers uh, can reproduce, they're not patented seeds, and then they reproduce it in uh, their farms and, and uh, not getting dependent on this in, uh, uh, agri-food and uh, value chain. So I think that the seeds uh, are quite important in the, uh, defending the people's rights for food, uh, for culturally appropriate food and the rights to define their system, because this is the beginning of uh, any food we, we have as a seed. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, let's finish the go round and then we'll pick up some questions from the chat. Yeah, Serge, would you like to yeah, respond to uh, what you've heard from the other panelists? Yeah. Yes, I would like to emphasize even more on the importance of uh, heirloom reproducible seeds. As Natalia just said, this was already started in called the Green Revolution back in the 50s, after the Second World War, where uh, feds were uh, offered uh, free seeds for a while, and then suddenly they had to pay for it. So this is like a, <clears throat> it's a blatant uh, uh domination approach where uh, suddenly farmers find themselves unable to produce anything without the uh, without the package that comes with uh, this so it's the it's the hybrid uh, uh, non reproducible uh, sterile seeds it's the uh, package that comes with the the whole uh, chemical uh, uh, you know the chemical bulk uh, it comes all together and it gets the peasants, it gets us in a place where not only are we dependent on a foreign currency and a foreign uh, production system, we are also uh, uh, stuck in a very destructive loop of our own ecosystems because of this practice. So there's these two things happening at the same time. We are losing our soil and our water sources. And then we also have to uh, uh, find the money to buy it. But the, the most terrifying thing is actually land grab, I believe. And the most terrifying example right now is Palestine, which uh, I ju just said that uh, even the planted areas uh, where there is actual production, there is no access to it. So this is something we, uh, we really need, need to keep uh, in mind because uh, at some point we get to the point where uh, only a pot on the balcony is what's standing between a people uh, and uh, starvation. So this is, uh, honestly, I find it terrifying. I, I find that uh, just the fact that you don't even have access to land or water is uh, probably the, the most inhumane thing 
But then on the positive side, just the fact of having a seed uh, library, we stopped calling it bank because we have problems with, we, we hate banks uh, in Lebanon. But anyways, uh, let's call it a, a seed place, uh, a seed house is probably the first step towards uh, everything. After that, again, as I said before, uh, I think access to knowledge and spreading the knowledge is one of the emergencies not to forget the actual real, real uh, realist uh, emergencies of access to land and water but yes uh, mainly uh, this is it and maybe because it's a, a, a let's call it a professional de def def deformation like i'm uh, i can see anything outside of the spectrum of seeds but this is where it begins and uh, maybe the work of making baal seeds uh, like seeds that only depend on uh, rainwater is uh, uh, honestly uh, it's uh, it's amazing uh, a lot of respect to you for uh, and to everyone but uh, it's uh, right now it's a very emotional stage in uh, where we are in our region and this is uh, this is the main thing that we need to focus on just uh, regaining this yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Sarah. Thank yeah, a good transition, Andrew, for you maybe to say a few words because I know that you, uh, yeah, think a lot about climate change and the impacts uh, for also ecosystems and the environments, right? Because it's not only the people that are suffering from this, but all the living world and webs of life. So, yeah, if you would want to respond to other panelists, offer a few comments, that would be great. Sure. Maybe I can pick up um, from where Serge ended off about reclaiming. Um, I think number one that reclaiming is critical to climate resilience, um, but also linked to to what Natalia was saying. And she got me thinking about this notion of the quiet movement and it got me thinking how relevant this is to South Africa. You know, with our history of colonial dispossession, so much was taken away from indigenous populations, including seed and food heritages. Um, and today the kind of our food system is, is corporate dominated, agribusiness dominated. And an added challenge is that they have a high level of social legitimacy in, in much of the public eye. You know, they're seen as these are the good people that feed us, you know. Um, and so the the well, that's one of the challenges to confront in, 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 in working towards food sovereignty in our food system is that legitimacy. But also at the same time, you know, so many people aren't served by that system, even though many people aspire to be. Um, who that the and there's a lot of work going on platforms and so on inspired by food sovereignty and seed sovereignty visions that are in pockets reclaiming the seed heritage um reclaiming what was lost and trying to multiply um for example through seed a lot of them are called seed banks still here so let me rather call them seed houses and so on um and so there's that reclaiming work that has to be done and and some are also frame it in terms of decolonization work that our corporate food system is a colonizer, a colonial food system. Um, and so these practices of reclaiming are critical to challenging the coloniality of the food system. But the, 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 the challenge I think is, you know, when I'm listening especially to Fuad about the, the Palestinian situation where uh, how important it is to see our food sovereignty struggles as inseparable from wider class and political and national liberation struggles. Um, that that the 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 white those wider contexts also place severe limits on what we can do in terms of achieving food sovereignty, and so we must always sort of maintain that wider socially emancipatory lens, where it's critical that you know practices around seed, practices around agroecology, are critical components of food sovereignty, but we must always be linking that to. Um, uh, the deeper pursuit of social transformations and social changes, and I think what Natalia was saying about the the moment of the the the, the Maidan moment and shifting from a quiet movement to a more sort of, as I understood it, a broadest food sovereignty vision in Ukraine linked to the wider geopolitical and social context, I think um, illustrated that quite well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, yeah, Fuad, it would be yeah, brilliant also to hear your responses to the speaker and maybe also pick up on uh, the question that we have in the chat uh, from Patrick uh, to expand a little bit more about the agricultural uh, cooperative movement uh, in Palestine. Okay, thank you again. And, and um, yes, I don't even, I, I do agree with my colleagues about uh, the naming of the seed bank. The bank, I don't like even using the word of bank because of the background of it, of it, but we can call it whatever we want. 
before I jump to the cooperative issue, because we have a very good like uh, uh, progress in, in, in this like topic. And um, I think seeds is like the, the core of the food sovereignty. If we want to arrive to the point that we have uh, a real definition of, of the food sovereignty um, for each country in, in, with, with taking in consideration the um, reality in each country, I think uh, should, we should tackle the seeds and design that in the way that we can produce that. In 2003, I just gave a quick example. In 2003, um, uh, while we are doing a survey, we uh, as a Palestinians and geos in, in, uh, in West Bank, we discovered that there is some uh, companies, seeds companies, uh, contacted the farmers at that time and tried to buy their uh, own local seeds from individual uh, farmers. You know, local seeds here is a heritage for the Palestinian as well. And it's, it's like, uh, to protect that, it was like uh, in, in different traditional way used by the very old farmers here. And they contacted by, by different type of, of, of seed companies, all of them linked to the Israeli companies, uh, to buy their, to collect and buy and pay a huge amount of money uh, to buy their like uh, local seeds. Then that was in Berbos, because they know that we have 85% 80, of our land in, in Palestine planted as grain fed, which means that we only use the seed, uh, local seeds. It's just the only local uh, adapted local uh, seeds that can be uh, planted and cultivated in our area. And for us, the, the, the seed is not just to food, but it's also the way that we can protect the land from being grabbed. Because if you leave your land empty for three up to five years, Israel, according to their laws, have the right to take that land and turn it to be state lands. Again, grab the land in the country. Cooperatives issue, yeah, it's, it's like, we believe in collective approach in dealing with the challenges that we have in Palestine. And um, the cooperative approach is one of the approaches that uh, we're applying here since like maybe 80 years ago, even before the incubation. And after the incubation, it become like um, uh, a great of like importance for the Palestinians to organize themselves in cooperatives. We have hundreds of cooperatives in West Bank and Gaza. Uh, the woman one is more active, in the frankly speaking. And they are like a producer cooperatives. They produce most of them. The ones belong to agriculture on the field that I'm working with. They are like um, a producer in different um, aspects and different sectors. Uh, they producing. They try to produce according to the area. Um, and, uh, some of them they producing food, vegetables. Some of them they producing like they are um, herders producing some. Um, um, and animals like production, etc. Uh, this is uh, how we succeeded also to deal and to use the limited resources that we have as a Palestinians in very efficient way. Because collective approach, when we apply it in cooperatives, I think we, this is um, su supporting and helping in arriving to the points that you don't need to deal individually for, with hundreds of hundreds of farmers, but you do that collectively. And, and if we add to that uh, closure and uh, uh, different checkpoints uh, and to uh, benefit as much as you can and to target the whole farmer in one village, you have to do that collectively through these cooperatives where they, uh, in systematic way, they organize the whole agricultural sector through these cooperatives. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Uh, we only have about five minutes left, and I would still like to yeah, invite uh, uh, invite Serge and Natalia to respond to uh, the Patrick's question around the agricultural cooperative movement in Lebanon. So, Serge, maybe over to you, and then Natalia, you can pick up that question together with uh, the uh, what consequences as well. To comment on that briefly, so, Serge. Yes, thank you. Uh, so basically, there's. Uh... Three to four kinds of cooperation happening right now uh, in Lebanon. One of them is uh, an old uh, tradition that is uh, regained uh, momentum because of the uh, economic collapse, which was in Arabic, we call it al awni which means the help or, or the uh, interhelp. So this is very uh, informal and it happens within villages and within uh 
different villages where people just uh, come around when there's the season and help each other out with the production or the harvest or etc. So this is still small scale. Uh, it's not like uh, it was in the in the 60s when there was a bigger rural tradition, but it's uh, regaining now, especially with the young people who live in the city and who realize that there is a need for helping out and they have the luxury of time. So this is one part. Now, uh, there's also another part, which is uh, born from the revolution from 2019, which uh, means many small collectives all around the country started connecting with each other and uh, trying to uh, uh, set up uh, a little bit of a larger scale uh, micro economy. So it is more of a trade uh, which is based on the, uh, let's call it the responsibility of the consumer. So basically it's people who are looking for uh, uh, decent, fair, uh, fairly produced uh, products and they themselves take the initiative of going to producers and asking for specific stuff and providing space for those producers to uh, sell uh, their products. And then there's stuff that uh, mostly NGOs are doing, which is trying to set up uh, local, uh, also kind of small scale uh, economies, but it's not as much cooperative as it is mainly funded in, funded in order to be uh, set up as infrastructures. And then there's the work that we and our comrades on the ground are doing, uh, which is the seed production cooperative from one side, the agroecology uh, coalition uh, on the other side. Uh, and then there's many other uh, uh, organization govern governance uh, types, uh, like the, uh, what's the word, uh, when workers, uh, uh, the union, uh, there's many unions that were uh, dismantled or uh, hijacked by the regime uh, back in the 80s that are being reborn or retaken now. Then there are the unions that uh, already exist and are completely controlled by the regime. And there's unions that are coming against these, like uh, the theater workers, the uh, agricultural workers, the... Uh, unions and that kind of uh, and that kind of model so there's many things happening uh mostly the difficulty was to talk to each other uh and this has been uh, only happening for the past three years which is not much but it's uh, already uh, starting uh, and then there is the rest of the reviving and the reclaiming of what we already had in informal systems and how to articulate them with the modern ways of communicating and working and the modern ways of governance. So uh, very quickly, this is uh, most of the landscape of uh, of what there is in Lebanon right now. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, thank you, uh, Natalia. Yes, I know that there, I don't have uh, time to, to talk much. And I also saw there are more questions to me and, and there are also more direct uh, messages to me. So I just want to say thanks for all the questions and we can continue uh, via email. So you can just write me an email and we can talk further on it. So you asked me about the cooperative movement in, in Ukraine. Uh, the cooperatives are not so successful in Ukraine. Uh, there are different explanations and I would uh, um, uh, think rather than it's a Soviet history of collective agriculture that influenced people, you know, that they don't want to have this collective uh, initiative in the way how they, you know, how they perceive it. And um, but there are a lot of collaboration, a lot of uh, uh, sort of cooperative uh, uh, interactions are taking place through informal networks. I think that's important uh, to, 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 to know the informal economy is still very powerful and in the informal networks and uh, those who keeps, uh, you know, the the small scale that's running. Uh, and there's also uh, the uh, state law on the cooperatives, which is uh, quite recently adopted by the Home Narada, and it's very unpopular and it, uh, many social movements and, and, and the scholars criticize it, saying that it benefits in the large agro holdings mostly. So they're calling to, you know, to, to revert that, that law. We'll see what uh, happens next. And um, just before I finish, and again, I would like to talk much more on, on different and answering different questions you asked and about food uh, insecurity. I think it's very 
important and crucial. And uh, let me just finish with uh, just a few numbers. Um, according to their recent investigation is that um, one in three uh, households in Ukraine are currently food insecure because of the war. And in Eastern regions, it's even higher. It's 50 percent of households are food insecure. And there is a critical importance of um, uh, food aid in this context. Uh, and as also encouraging the food distribution and food self-provisioning. And uh, the next year will start, it's already quite soon, uh, as one of the sub-projects of my research, looking at the food aid versus food self-provisioning, because food aid it has its limitations and has some uh, also problems. So we will see what is the most efficient way to uh, guarantee food security of displaced uh, populations. So, and I probably stop here, I will not take more time, but like, Let's continue this conversation offline. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to thank to all of the brilliant panelists for highlighting the many dimensions of why when we talk about the war, we must also talk about the environment, the land and the food and that food sovereignty is really inseparable from people's sovereignty. Um, and moving towards a healthy and just decolonial food production system. Is it a matter of idealism? It's really a matter of survival. It's a matter of different pattern of people owning the land uh, that they depend on for their survival. It's a matter of resisting the occupations. It's a matter of resisting the extractivist agricultural practices. It's a matter of people owning their seeds. It's a matter of unionizing and building alliances across gender, environmental, also all sorts of other struggles. So thank you so much to all the panelists for highlighting those. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the audience, to all of the attendees. Thank you so much to the interpreters who've made it possible uh, for this event to be uh, understood both in English and in Ukrainian. Um, I would also like finally to draw everyone